Welcome to Pitch It, the fintech startups podcast. One founder, one startup, one investor at a time. I'm your host, Todd Anderson, Chief Content Officer, Fintech Nexus. On episode 58, I bring to you a special episode, the Pitch It at Fintech Nexus Semifinals Round 1. The semifinals took place in the lead up to Fintech Nexus USA on May 11th and 12th. Our Pitch It startup competition features the next generation of Fintech founders. Semifinalists were selected from a larger group of more than 100 applicants. Companies squared off in a rapid-fire round of seven-minute pitches, followed by three minutes of Q&A, grilling from our judges, which featured some of the leading fintech VCs in the country. Semifinal round one featured the following startups. Conduit, NetSwitch, New Silver, Scylla, Sibo, and Upswap. Our judging panel included Andrew Steele of Activant Capital, Hillel, Olive Stone of Cross River, Kira Moon of Translink Capital, George Ravitch of Ravco Marketing, and Rakafet Rusak Aminoch of Team 8. Now, without further ado, I present Pitch It at Fintech Nexus Semifinals Round 1. I hope you all enjoy the show. Welcome, welcome. This is our annual uh, pitch competition. Uh, my name is Todd Anderson. I am the chief product officer, chief content officer at Lendit. Uh, you can see um, our judges and the companies that will be joining us here today. Um, so thank you for joining us as um, an attendee um, and watching our companies here. So just a quick introduction into Pitch It and, and kind of what you'll see here today. So Pitch It is our startup competition. This is now our seventh year um, running Pitch It at our USA event. We also do it at our other properties, Europe and, and LATAM. Uh, we've also done it in China when we had an event there. Uh, but essentially, it's our way to bring startups into the Lendit uh, community, to have access to investors, to partners, uh, to other uh, founders for mentorship, for potential investment, potential opportunities. It's really a way that we find um, valuable for startups to enter the ecosystem. Uh, and so a lot of the companies you'll see here today, they've had some requirements, which is, you know, they haven't raised a certain amount of money. Most are in the, you know, raised somewhere between 1 million and 20 million. Um, they haven't uh, been founded before uh, 2017. So most are fairly new companies, though with some traction. Um, and um, it's a way for them to, like I said, access uh, the ecosystem. Each company will get a 10, basically a 10 minute slot or about 10 minutes. They'll have seven minutes to pitch. And then the judges will get a few minutes to ask them some questions. So it'll be rapid fire kind of around the room. Uh, we'll have some fun. So sit back, relax. Uh, I don't know if the companies will relax, but I certainly will watching. Um, and we will get started in a second. But first, I do want to say a special thanks to some of our judges. Um, you know, without the judges being part of this, um, you know, we can't um, have these competitions, so we need their help. We need their, um, you know, their wisdom. Andrew Steele of Active and Capital, Hillel Olivestone of Digital Ventures, Cross River, Kira Moon of TransLink Capital, George Ravitch of Ravco Marketing, uh, and then we also have Rakafet Rusek Aminot of Team 8. Uh, and so um, thank you, a special thank you to our judges for your time um, and uh, for your wisdom and being able to join us from all your different time zones. Special thanks to our Israeli uh, participants here because I know it's late there. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and we are going to go with our first company, which is Conduit. So Nish, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and we will get started and I will put 10 minutes 
Uh, seven minutes for your pitch on the clock. Ten total minutes or about that with judges' questions. So, Nish, please tell us when you are ready. Todd, I'm, I'm trying to do screenshot. I think uh, I don't have the permissions yet. So when you hit the green button to share your screen, go now. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, it's working. Okay. And, and uh, just uh, FYI, Sishir here will be um, um, kind of swapping in for a minute to give a de quick demo of the platform. Um, I don't know how, if you can enable him, um, but it would be around the three minute mark. So let me, uh, yeah, let me screen share here and get started. Okay. All right, uh, so thanks Todd and uh, all the judges here for inviting us. Uh, we can go to full screen here. Um, all right, um, so uh, we are very excited to be talking here about Conduit. Conduit is an embedded FinTech platform. It enables banks to onboard and quickly test FinTech solutions. Uh, FinTechs have exploded in the past decade and they now touch all as, uh, parts of the financial services uh, system. But if you look at the mid-sized banking space, they have been largely untouched by this revolution. Uh, something as simple as an instant rate check is not found in 90% of the banks and credit unions. And the list goes on and on. Uh, these are some of just some of the things that you, uh, consumers are demanding and have become increasingly popular in the recent past. Uh, so of course, they've lost market share uh, by some estimates about 40% over the past uh, 10 years or so. Um, and uh, this is an important segment, right? Not just because of the size, six trillion assets, about a third of the market, but also for what it disproportionately provides, which is access to the underbank and more support to the local businesses, especially during credit cycles. Um, so why has FinTech adoption been a challenge? Uh, I think there are basically two reasons uh, that uh, most of uh, us who come from uh, sort of like uh, on the other side of the fence, uh, which is banking, and having been in these organizations that we have deal with. So just uh, the explosion uh, and the choices and can uh, justify the cost of individual fintechs. And of course, uh, the complexity of the integration, right? But I think we're at the cusp of a technology evolution where some of these will go away and the narrative can be flipped. Uh, no code in particular has become popular uh, over the past few years and it allows the business owners to seize control and add these uh, things over uh, in layers and reap the benefits in a multiplicative way. Also, Web3 and API allows uh, for, and, uh, for integration techniques that obviously need for individual fintech integration. So Conduit uh, is a platform that we have designed. It's SaaS-based. It it's fundamentally no code uh, from, uh, and designed for business users. And it uses Web3 smart contracts to allow for fintech interoperability. Uh, Sushil is going to um, go over some of the, give you a, like a little peek into our platform. So, but it allows for easily uh, uh, business users to drag and drop, configure these fintechs, and see the impact of the overall fintechs at an enterprise level for a CEO or a chief lending officer or a business executive. Ultimately, our vision is this for Conduit. We want uh, for the banks to easily add small features and apps, which is what fintech provide but then allow a platform over which they can make workflows and add layers and layers of fintech. And ultimately the vision is a full stack that the conduit offers of fintech solutions, of permitted fintech solutions that can, uh, that can uh, replace the legacy stacks that, uh, that the banks and the credit unions currently deal with. So with that, let me hand it over to Sishir uh, to show you a little bit about how the platform operates before telling you a little bit about team and our traction. So let me stop share here and hand it over to Sushant. Uh, all right. Uh, so let me show you how easy it is to add and configure fintechs. The Conduit platform uh, offers a few set of fintechs that you can see right now, for example, rate check, lead gen, AI model credit and decline funding. Let me start by showing you a simple example with a rate check fintech. Adding a rate check fintech allows a bank to do pre-qualification and do fraud and ID verification. The bank can also add fintechs to provide downstream services, line decline funding. Adding decline funding increases uh, access to the underbank. Now, once you are done adding the fintechs, you can configure these individual fintechs. For example, I can choose rate check 
choose the type of product for which, which I want to enable rate check and then provide the fee. Similarly, I can move to decline funding and choose the set of fintechs that are, that are being offered by the platform along with the service. Once we are done configuring the fintechs, we can, we can then, the bank can then go and choose in which fashion they want to send their data in real time. They can integrate it with the existing providers like a Meridian Link or a Temenos or provide their own API specifications. Now, once a bank, uh, you know, once the configuration is done, we support reporting in terms of something we call as FinTech scorecard. So let me go there. Yeah, so th this, is this is what is a FinTech scorecard. It, uh, it is something that is used by the CEOs and business heads to, uh, to kind of analyze the overall FinTech adoption uh, growth. This was asked by one of our customers who wanted to know, uh, how fintech adoption has led to business growth, the consumers that have been touched through the, through the new fintech services, and the recommendations on the next set of fintechs to be adopted. Apart from this, there are numerous other reportings uh, that are uh, available for tracking the performance of individual fintechs. Uh, Nish, you can uh, take over. Anish, you're on mute. Uh, Nishya is still on mute. Yeah, I'm still on mute. Uh, Nishya, right. yeah. there we go. Okay, all right. So let me quickly wrap up here with uh, our team and our uh, progress so far. So I uh, am the founder at Conduit, uh, worked uh, previously for the past 12 years at some of the larger banks, such as Capital One and New Trade, and seen uh, sort of like their digital and tech sort of maturity and also worked at uh, some of the local regional banks uh, over a period of time, such as uh, MNT and Penfed. And I think that uh, this sort of like differential experience led me to starting Conduit. Um, so should you want to just quickly tell a little bit about yourself? So I am the head of engineering here at Conduit. I have a total of six years of experience in full stack cloud and no, no code stack development. Before joining Conduit, I was in Amazon's AWS, uh, working on their cloud development kit. Uh, I was the first engineer here at Conduit, and since then, uh, I have built the engineering team out here. That's about me. Thanks. And then wrapping up here with a little bit about our progress. So we rolled out the MVP in quarter one. Uh, we are onboarding our first set of banks, Republic Finance and Citizens. Uh, there are other banks in the pipeline that uh, that we have signed up uh, and then for our continued bank acquisition we have a partnership with Stephen. Um, we have about uh, 10 fintechs that we've onboarded the big names where there are even Pagaya is uh, we have a term sheet from Pagaya for the client funding that we had, that we want to onboard and then there are a bunch of other fintechs that some of which you saw when Sushu was giving a demo. Uh, but again, th thanks again for inviting us and allowing us to tell us uh, tell you guys a little bit about Conduit. All right. Thank you, uh, Nish. Uh, and thank you, um, Shashir. Uh, judges, uh, any questions? Uh, if you want to ask a question, just go ahead and come off mute and, and ping our, our company with any questions you might have. Sure. Yeah, I ask um, a question. Oh, sorry. Sure, go ahead. Kira first. Wanna, <laughs> uh, I have two. George, you might want to fire away. Uh, I'm happy to go first. Uh, what's the business model of of your company? What let's start with that. What's the business model? Yeah, so the business model is um, sorry, we, we took out that slide just in the interest of time for this format, but uh, we charge a platform access fee, which is thousand dollars per month per bank, and then uh, the all the fees uh, uh, for the fintechs goes through us, and we have a retain about fifteen to thirty percent commissions on those revenues. The high end is for uh, the GMV sort of the usage is more based on closed uh, products like loans or deposits. Uh, and the low end is uh, 10 to 15 percent is for data and tech type of things. So if I understand you correctly, a bank that uses this similar to the, uh, the Apple uh, store, uh, yeah. app store pays a percent or the, the takes a percent of each uh, time this is being used yeah, in these acts. Is that right? 
That, that's actually an analogy yeah, we also use uh, quite often. So all the fintechs that will be using our routes and fees and we have a, a, a retain some commission for it. Okay. And just one other question real quick. The scorecard that you showed a couple of times, who is that for? Who, who is that to, uh, who is it scoring? It is, it is, uh, it is showing the uh, top line impact uh, of adopting a bunch of fintechs to the conduit platform to uh, whoever is the business sponsor at a bank of credit union, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, like this came through a request with one of our bank partners. And so typically I mean, I, when I was at Fentred, for example, I would have to go back to the board and report or the executive committee and report about like how our investments are working. And so basically what it shows is how many customers in aggregate are touched. Uh, how, what is the total loan growth or deposit growth, whatever is meaningful and can be customized. And then it, it has a recommendation about the next set of fintechs available on the platform that if adopted can uh, further increase the impact. Okay, thank you. Can I have a cl cl clarification uh, question? Yes, absolutely. What is the, uh, the benefit for the end customer? Or you just want to make it um, to, to bring him more offers? That's it. The, you mean the consumers? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think uh, this is something that I developed an appreciation from after I moved from working at some of the larger banks at Capital One in E-Trade and then going and working even for some something as small as Pentred, uh, which is the second largest trade union, but still is like more like a regional bank. I think the products fundamentally at smaller regional banks are more customer friendly if you remove the customer experience part, the rates and fees are better and so if you can bridge that gap because their sources of capital are cheap and they are competing as larger players they usually tend to price their products uh more in a more consumer friendly manner and so i think that is what uh, what you get like i mean if you go and compare for a loan a rate you get a lending club versus at a pen fed uh, local credit union they will always win except that they don't uh, consumers don't have the value of this so actually more supply, better prices. That's right. So increase, uh, one way to think about this, we are actually increasing the actual liquidity. There's liquidity, but it's not uh, a consumer or not a bank. And the side of the banks, you, you are targeting regional banks only or also the large incumbents? So we, uh, we have built, we built a conduit platform primarily for the mid-size uh, segment, which we define as half a billion to about 30 billion. Um, and consumer products. Ultimately, if you look at the vision, it is to provide an alternate digital and tech stack. I think like five, 10 years down the road, when you have a suite of fintechs available on the platform, while it won't be a, a complete replacement to the core system, uh, there are large parts of the core systems that are offered by providers such as Geminos or Meridian Link that a platform like Conduit can replace. Thank you. Does do you guys manage the entire relationship or does the bank have to create individual relationships with every fintech that it chooses? So are you just doing the technical inter integration or is there also vendor management oversight, individual contracts? You know, every single time you, you partner with someone as a financial institution, it's a whole, it's a whole to do. No, we onboard the fintechs that are available on the platform. So we do all the sort of like regulatory and some due diligence uh, around that. I mean, we are, we are more of a tech enabled platform. So our due diligence is more around, like if I'm picking this, is this a good, uh, like uh, are they already working with some uh, OCC, FDC, FDIC regulated entities? Uh, are they giving us a good rate? And then there's just one of that. And then, uh, so the banks don't have to do individual due diligence, but those things are available for them to, uh, to see if they, if they want to. And one thing to clarify, what does it mean uh, when you say Web3 in power? Yeah, so I, 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 unfortunately we couldn't get into a lot of it. So the way interoperability works is like when you have uh, multiple fintechs and a decentralized execution of transaction, imagine there's one fintech that's doing rate check, another one which is doing an AI modeling, and then the, 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 the transaction is going over to you for consumption to a bank. Like how do you do uh, intercommunication and runtime management, right? And so the old way about doing it is passing data back and forth and trying to reconcile. 
uh, what we want to do is, uh, um, you know, use smart contracts to actually automatically reconcile so that no data has been shared. And, and it's a very manual process, right, prone to uh, disputes and, you know, uh, you know, other types of secondary reconciliation. So, so we plan to build, uh, like, uh, there are part systems we have not built, but uh, the smart three contracts we plan to build on Ethereum uh, blockchain. Got it. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Nish, thank you very much. And thank you to Conduit. Thank you, judges, for your questions. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next company. Um, so if Chris of NetSwitch, if you're ready, uh, we did have another company, Moontree, who was unable to make it today. So we had to move on from Moontree. Uh, and now we have NetSwitch that's up next. So Chris, if you want to share your screen, Come off mute. Come on camera. Yes, I will. Give me a second. <laughs> no problem. I'm oh, right. sorry, storing it. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think you guys see it. No. Yes. Yep. We see your screen. There okay. you go. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, take it away. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, I am. We're talking about NetSwitch this afternoon. Thanks for having us. It is a um, payment service for card payments as well as cardless payments. We will go through the details of it, myself and Suresh. Um, who are we targeting as our customers? Suresh, you can go to the next one. We're targeting um, banks who will primarily have legacy 10, 20 year old card platforms, program managers who build applications and offer to their customers, the large FinTech group, as well as enterprise companies looking for a innovative platform to do all kinds of unique payment solutions. Who are the key players? Um, Suresh um, will be taking over the uh, rest of the presentation after the next one. Suresh is from Google, but 12 years ago, bought a bank, CBW Bank, and um, did all kinds of innovative service within the bank. NetSwitch started as this idea of what troubles bank go through integrating with current platforms. From there, um, the NetSwitch uh, set up to do offer a service to other banks as well as the rest of the groups. They worked many years at FIS, building large enterprise customers. I myself came from the old Bell system and Bell Labs built couple of ventures. The last one is in the payment platform, primarily for healthcare, and successfully sold that about three years ago. Chris, you forgot to turn on your video. Anyway, go ahead. What's that, Suresh? Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Um, go to the next one. The... Yeah, Suresh, you want to take it over? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, Chris, thank you very much. Chris has been humble. He's actually sold, built card platforms twice and sold, and Dave has done it as well. Uh, and, uh, the, and the problem for needing a new card platform started. I think Shamir is in the call. Hi, Shamir. I think it started with Simple when they started to work with a the bank. They noticed how painful it was to find a good card platform. Um, so today, we are very happy to announce that we built a cloud native issuing platform for credit and debit cards. We can, we can actually do both credit and debit on a on the credit rail itself. Um, we have all the uh, power web power uh, features, uh, which is real-time decisioning, just-in-time funding, budget controls, card controls, uh, merchant-specific usage. And also, more importantly, we see the card platform as a bridge to the future, or as, as opposed to a legacy you know, clunker that you know, many of these old 30-year-old vintage platforms are. We have successfully achieved blockchain integration into the bank. We are able to authorize against uh, a private chain at this point. And there's a whole bunch of new features coming around that, including we already integrated to smart contracts and all of that. So we'll talk about that a little later, but um, the platform, uh, general overview, it is like any other platform because it's legacy, you have to conform to protocols, but we have built in a few modules that allows us to connect to programmable ledgers, which we have successfully done. And we are live with customers on these things. So I'll skip this. Um, the next question is, why do you need a new card platform? Well, there's the, you know, the 20,000 plus banks in the world run 30-year-old uh, vintage platforms that need to be fixed. Uh, um, that is one. Two, 
um, there's a whole bunch of features that we needed as a bank on the bank side that we needed that we have built out. And then we said, how do we compare ourselves to the incumbents in the industry? So we did about, uh, we identified over 150 features. We analyzed each one of them individually and also in the in terms of how well they were executed. And then we came up with a matrix. We said, we need to be able to support a complex use case of a FinTech or a bank across a broad demographic they need to address. So we took that position and we have a more comprehensive feature set, uh, including the blockchain integration that gives us a, an upper right-hand position in this chart, right? So I'll, I'll quickly talk about go to market. I'm not gonna spend too much time on how big the market is. Everybody knows about cards and cardless, so virtual cards and all of those things. So we said, how do we enter the market as a new player? Uh, we looked at the market as uh, low margin to high margin and high switching cost, meaning getting someone to switch to our platform versus a low switching cost. And we focused on high margin, low switching cost and the green colored dots tell you where we've already signed customers. We already signed customers in buy now, pay later uh, in healthcare for virtual cards, for vendor payments, corporate spend, uh, there's a bunch of new healthcare companies that have signed us up. Uh, we have a couple of new fintechs and we're also launching a new HSA card. So uh, the market size are very large. So there's no point in talking about how much market share we're going to get. It's more of how much revenue and how many customers we can sign as fast as possible. And we have a pretty long, decent pipeline. A sample example of uh, programs we've already signed, uh, ranging from BNPL to merchant funding to HSA to corporate spends. Uh, we have targeted over 2,500 fintechs. We have 100 plus fintechs in our database. We have uh, closed on five fintechs, about one bank and two enterprises, all in the last few months. We're about six months in the market now. Uh, we have signed a million and a half in ARR already, and we think we can get that to about 10 million next year. Uh, and our goal is to hit a 100 million run rate uh, by the fourth year. Um, so on, this is kind of where we are on the revenue side. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. I think I finished earlier than uh, the previous presentation. Well, that's that's not a, never a problem here. Uh, finishing a little early. I, but, I can uh, skip to one of these slides and uh, hold, <laughs> be holding here. So. All right. Any uh, any questions from our judges? I'll jump in. Thanks, guys. This is a really really impressive uh, impressive uh, overview. So. You know, looking at this space, there has been quite a bit of innovation, right? We've seen a few different waves of card issuing uh, come into the market. Um, you know, I think even Stripe has left some room in the in this market for, for everyone else to attack. But how do you think of the credit versus the debit part? Because like th those are distinctly different. Um, no, credit has been less less, uh, I guess, penetrated by by fintech recently. But very curious how you think about that and then how that impacts. Yeah, it's a very, very good question, right? So we actually have a credit card uh, deal in the process of being signed. Uh, it turns out the actual switching uh, technology is the same. It is in the back end. In one, you're authorizing against uh, a deposit side. Other one, you're authorizing against a line of credit, right? So we have rudimentary uh, charge card already being signed at this point. Uh, then the more complex lines of credit, the complexity comes in the interest rate calculation. So we have a fee engine that we have already at this point and we'll be able to launch. Essentially, the goal is, we didn't want to talk about it here, but the low goal is to launch credit card as a service with debit rails integrated. So which means in real time, our logic will say, hey, you're using a Starbucks. We don't need to, and you've told us not to use the credit side. Let's go use your debit, which means you only need one card. Yeah, uh, and depending on where how you configure it, just go take the money from the right bucket. That's very powerful. And we have that, and we have a whole demand for that on the credit as a service already from all the lenders. Uh, we have a massive pipeline on that side, but I didn't want to talk about it because we've just generally, if you look at our vintage, like Chris and we rather do it and then talk about it. So we said we'll just do it first. So yeah, so I think that was the ATM cash, right? You can go to your checking account to draw versus a credit cash advance. Yeah. So it turns out the better way to look at it is the legacy guys were super glued into certain constructs. Once we unglued ourselves and made it more programmable as you're ready, then you can run any kind of backend logic to make uh, any kind of payment work in a compliant fashion. So now suddenly we have amazing freedom on all kinds of constructs we can create uh, on this one. And, and the credit side comes with a bank. A bank has to provide you a blessing on that because at the end of the day, it's on a balance sheet lending, yep. right? So, but great question, but that is that is the next frontier. 
And I look at Stripe and say, hey, they've super glued themselves to some extent. Market has super glued itself. They, they are now eight year, 10 year vintage. Galileo is 25 year old vintage. So we are like more of two year, one year vintage now. So. Uh, ask a question. Um, it's not clear to me the, the big reason why your customers or prospects are coming to you. What is it about the, the, that you bring to the marketplace that people are really uh, uh, after? What's, what's resonating in the marketplace? Oh, sure. Oh, that's a fantastic question. So if you look at uh, what we're able to do, I'm not able to show the APIs right now, but uh, one is uh, the breadth of the APIs that I'll give an example. We have, a, I'll give you several examples to give. We have an existing Bino pay later who's already using Marketa, right? And another, they have two players, they always have two players because they do about three to 5,000 virtual cards a day. They had a particular customer situation where they had to construct a virtual card use case, which is proprietary to them. So I don't want to talk about it in a public forum. They came to us and said, can you do it? And we were able to mock it up and show it to them in a matter of days, how they could use our platform. They immediately signed a contract. They've agreed to give us 30% of their volume, which is let's say 30% of about $2 billion a year in volume. So we have already signed that contract. So that is one example. Uh, we have another one where uh, I think it's something to do with healthcare and Chris can talk about it, but they wanted a particular type of buy no pay later situation pharmacies that required uh, the cars to work in a certain specific way at a certain time in a certain place. And we were able to deliver that in a, in a mock-up demo for them rapidly within a day. So they decided that we had the ability to do so. So there's two things. So one is we have a length and breadth of APIs that are comparable or maybe slightly better than market in some areas. The second one is we're able to do on specific domains. We have domain expertise like healthcare we are able to address their concerns rapidly, which is something Marketa is not able to do today. So that's the differentiation at this point. And the third one is the credit and debit rails we're able to do on a single rail. That at this point, nobody has it. We're the only ones in the market. The final one is the blockchain integration. The healthcare company that is signing with us, they also were using a public blockchain or, or an enterprise version of the blockchain to do their stuff. They loved the fact that we could write into the blockchain through the card platform as well. Just on that last point, that was my other question. What is the purpose of blockchain uh, in your application? Oh, very good. So it turns out the first bank we integrated into runs a layer two blockchain internally. So we had no choice, but to authorize against that bank, we had to build ECDSA key infrastructure into the protocol itself. So we took the old ISO 8053 protocol, injected ECDSA keys that are specific to being able to authorize against an account, just the way you would, you would use uh, your private key to initiate a transaction or public blockchain or even a layer two. So once we did that, it allowed us to access, be part of smart contracts, which would then fire up a issue to create a virtual card for a BNPL. So all these things that are already in place in this particular customer where they're using the blockchain in a very, they've already processed $70 billion in the blockchain they needed all these things. So we were able to build all these as part of that. Now we are finding that that is very useful for other people who are already using uh, some variant of a blockchain to operate their business. Because in, once you have a blockchain, the native, the way to authorize something is to use a private key against an address. And if your card system cannot support it, you'll have to then create a transformation layer where you lose the advantage of all the security the blockchain provides. You have to use a key infrastructure somewhere else that translates. So if I, I think it's in the next slide or something. You can see here where we have the green colored dots. Uh, this is where we inject our keys. We're able to inject keys and move it into a programmable ledger. Oh, thank you. Somebody took a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that answers the question. I don't know if I give you the exact answer what you're looking for, but I'm happy to spend more time to show you how this actually runs in real in the real world. And your existing client and also the pipeline is more concentrated around healthcare sector or uh, any other sectors that you're no, going No, it's at? actually, uh, if you yeah. look at the chart here, uh, there are segments that we'd love to get into. We are working on like travel. Uh, so if you look at uh, healthcare is uh, where uh, Chris has expertise and we have some very deep knowledge through Chris uh, on uh, solving some problems there. And it's a highly regulated industry. Uh, so it helps to be very uh, focused on compliance and regulation. Uh, we are seeing a lot of demand from BNPL. We are seeing a lot of demand and corporate spend and vendor payments as well. Uh, so it's across the board. 
Uh, we're also seeing new healthcare companies, new the earned wage guys for switching to uh, card issuance. Uh, we are seeing new fintechs come to us. New fintechs are coming for only a couple of reasons. One is it's taking them eight months to get onboarded with Galileo or even longer with FIS. So they want someone who can rapidly onboard them. We happen to be new and we don't have we don't have thousand customers, so we're able to onboard them faster. So that's practically one reason they're coming to us. Other one is when they see the feature set we have, they're able to think of new things they can do to serve their customers, like merging credit and debit rails, having multiple buckets, all those things. They realize, oh, I could do this too, right? Because they're new and they're contemplating. So that's what we are seeing today. Got it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Chris, Suresh, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have New Silver and Kirill. Kirill, if you want to share your screen and take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. Sharing my screen. All right. We can see it. Perfect. All right. So my name is Kirill Bensonov. I'm the co-founder and CEO of New Silver. We've been around for uh, going on three years now, uh, started in 2019, and uh, we're building an honorium to decentralize finance for the real estate asset class. Uh, and I'll get into the, the depth of what that means uh, here in the next slides. Um, so I guess for the folks that don't know or, or may want to refresh on what decentralized finance is, um, it, it basically is a blockchain-based system that without relying on intermediary, intermediaries using smart contracts, uh, created a new uh, financial system, essentially. Uh, and, and today, decentralized finance is not very good at onboarding real estate as collateral. Uh, DeFi was built uh, to, you know, for lending and for other purposes. I mean, there's, there's a ton of different use cases, but it was, it was purpose-built for crypto assets primarily. Uh, Real-world assets such as real estate and others were never part of the ecosystem, um, and, there, and, and um, you know, we're, we're aiming to solve that. Um, so just a few words on, on real estate. Uh, I'm sure most of, most of you guys know uh, it's a huge asset class, the largest asset class, I believe, in the world. Um, you know, around two trillion purchase transactions in the U.S. Um, alone. You know, five half a trillion in uh, commercial real estate, uh, around a hundred billion fix and flip, and fifty million. Only fifty million is using DeFi capital as of today, roughly. Um, and in DeFi specifically, there's over a hundred uh, DeFi protocols. Uh, there's around seventy billion total value locked, uh, though that I think decreased in the last few days a little bit. <laughs> um, and um, there's only two real world assets in the MakerDAO top 20 vaults. And MakerDAO is the largest or one of the largest uh, DeFi uh, protocols. Uh, and they essentially, what they do is, uh, until very recently, they used to lend their stablecoin, which is called DAI, against crypto collateral, which is similar to what many others do. But Maker was one of the first or one of the best. or um, and, uh, you know, they've grown to a substantial size. Um, and there's a lot of appetite to grow real world assets amongst uh, the DeFi protocols today. Um, problem number two, fix and flip lenders, the ability to liquidate loans is slow and expensive. Uh, fix and flip loans, just a quick definition, is essentially a short term mortgage lending for non-owner occupied properties. Primarily, it's done for the purposes of purchasing uh, renovating and reselling that property. Uh, so it's a business purpose type of a loan. Uh, the way that, um, and, and I know I'm kind of going in a slightly different direction, but I'm going to tie it all together in a second here. But the way that uh, fix and flip lenders today uh, do their business is essentially they lend to a, a borrower. Um, and then most of them, the vast majority of them, uh, go through a process to sell their loans to an aggregator. So an aggregator will essentially buy up a bunch of loans and then that aggregator will securitize them uh, in the public markets, traditional markets that, you know, all of this whole process, I mean, from the lender to the securitization could take months, just from the lender to the aggregator takes weeks. There's a bunch of issues like uncertainty, uh, interest rate changes, cost, manual labor. I mean, a ton of different things that are um, um, not working well here. Um, and obviously, when the aggregators go to securitize in the public markets, costs are uh, 
fairly large. Uh, I, I mean, a million dollars is like the least that one can expect to, to spend if they're going out securitizing, doing a you know, fixed income offering in the public markets in the US. Um, so essentially what New Silver is doing is on-ramping real estate loans to DeFi. Um, and um, you know, this is kind of the, the process. I mean, at a high level, uh, New Silver is able to directly originate loans um, as sort of a, a tech-enabled lender to, to directly to borrowers in the United States. Uh, we do, you know, tech-enabled data-driven underwriting, um, and and we quick we can quickly originate those loans, and uh, we can buy loans from other small lenders. Uh, same, very similar process, and then we essentially take those loans um, and we uh, securitize them or turn them into a blockchain-based asset and uh, pull liquidity from the blockchain. So we are um, uh, New Silver is, um, and I, I'll cover that in a second, actually. Uh, but the reason why decentralized finance makes sense is there's no correlation to the uh, to any you know, federal government. Uh, so interest rate arbitrage uh, could be possible, especially in today's environment. Um, obviously, blockchain is technology driven, so tokens are programmable. You could create your own uh, process. You can do whatever you want with code. Um, the co cost is a lot lower. Uh, it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient. Um, and then why fix and flip specifically? Uh, we chose this uh, area because um, you know the, the subsector of, of real estate transactions because it's we think it's a great wedge into a potentially a wider real estate market. Uh, it was the least tech enabled in our opinion uh, as uh, compared to like large banks or, or consumer fintechs um, that lend uh, you know for, for, uh, uh, you know consumer mortgage lenders. Uh, it's least it's the least regulated because uh, the loans are business purpose, so licensing is is minimal, uh, and it's highly fragmented. So there's around twenty thousand uh, small and mid-sized lenders in the U.S., and then around five hundred thousand brokers. And most of these, you know, ninety-nine percent go through the same process that I showed a little bit earlier, where um, they essentially you know lend their capital to a borrower, and then they go to sell this capital. They typically uh, you know, the majority of them do not hold um, these loans on their own balance sheet. They sell them off so that they can do another loan um, and continue that same process. Um, so our solution is basically, again, data-driven, fast, using decentralized finance, um, <clears throat> using analytics for, for institutions uh, and, and building other institutional level um, uh, technology to, to make it all work. Um, and so, you know, again, the differentiators that we're bringing to market are, we were actually the first to uh, securitize or to essentially enable this real world asset lending uh, 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 in a decentralized finance protocol. So we, were, we did this about a year ago with MakerDAO um, and, and another partner, Centrifuge. Uh, we've done about $45 million worth of these securitizations. We are as of right now, uh, the largest, from, from my knowledge at least, uh, uh, open real world asset pool uh, in decentralized finance. Uh, we have built a unique collateral verification process, which, uh, because this is a major challenge with, uh, uh, with real world lenders in general, with real estate specifically, it's a little bit different. Obviously, the real estate closing process in the US and I believe worldwide uh, is pretty archaic and um, it hasn't really been innovated. Um, and verifying the collateral is a big challenge for blockchains because if you think about traditional DeFi lending, someone has, I don't know, one ETH, uh, they send that Ether to another wallet, that wallet can verify the smart contract, verifies that it's there, now they have the collateral and it's locked. Uh, when lending against real estate, because it's done in the, in the real world, uh, blockchain does not know whether or not that loan was done, was it done correctly, is that collateral really there? So that's our mo is, is um, what we have is this uh, custodian uh, and then proof of reserves with Chainlink and, and you know, uh, an API driven process that enables DeFi uh, to know that, to be certain that that mortgage has actually been originated, it's real and the values are correct. Um, you know, we're fielding inquiries from various real estate related um, uh, organizations. There's a lot of interest in what we do today, and there's you know quite a quite a, a lot of activity in the in the space, and, and people obviously learning this is all kind of brand new and just starting out. Um, and just a quick note on our team. Um, obviously, I'm Kirill, and Alex and Alexi are are our co-founders.
And I believe that's it. Open the questions. All right. Thanks, Kirill. Questions from our judges. Yeah, question. Is the mortgage itself still documented as a regular traditional contract? Yes, the mortgage closing is not part of what we're um, building right now. The closing process, you know, we think it's, it, we hope somebody will um, will be able to do it on the blockchain. We're not the ones, uh, at least for, for now. So the, the closing happens in the real world, world, quote unquote. And then after that closing is done, the paper or there, there is e-closings now, obviously, um, you know, that's, that's been around. So the, uh, either the paper file or the e-note goes to a custodian. The custodian can verify that that mortgage is real. And then, and then we could basically, um, you know, uh, write it to the blockchain so that DeFi can, can see that it's actually been done and it's real in the amount and, and all of that other stuff. So this 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 part is actually tra reg regular traditional. Yeah, the the mortgage closings are traditional uh, for right now. That's not part of our, um, you know, that's not part of what we're uh, uh, building here, at least for now. Thank you. I have a question. Um, or actually, two questions. I I really would love to get a little bit deeper into why what the benefits are of using uh, blockchain in all of this, uh, and because you mentioned it earlier in one of your slides, uh, is this something that that the, the, the small lenders that you're aggregating for, I think that was your model, uh, they, they really feel the benefits of this? Uh, well, at, at the moment, we essentially obfuscate the blockchain from the lenders uh, completely. So. The lenders at this moment, uh, for now at least, they're not really concerned about blockchain. We don't, you know, they don't see blockchain. Uh, they don't deal with crypto or anything like that. And um, they, um, you know, uh, um, so everything happens in the real world. And the benefit of blockchain or DeFi, I should say, is that um, I mean, I guess there's there's quite a few, but it's a, it's a new form of liquidity. It's a new form of money that is completely uh, detached from the the central banks around the world right so right now uh, for example uh, interest rates are going up for uh, mortgage lenders and other lenders uh, in DeFi, that is, is not correlated there's no correlation or direct correlation i mean they may go up a little bit just because of uh, the macro markets and where people put their money but there's no direct correlation so nobody can tell a DeFi protocol that rates have to go up unless their community decides to do it all together um, and then obviously there's the technology angle and the, the lower cost and the, the efficiencies of, um, you know, of, of doing these securitizations on the blockchain versus in the real world. I mean, we, we don't have to deal with paper. Um, everything is on the blockchain. It's immutable. Uh, loans can be essentially moved quickly in and out. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of different benefits. Okay. The other question I had was, what is your uh, go-to-market plan? Meaning, are you going to be marketing this to the small lenders that you pack? How do you how do you grow this? How do you scale it? From right, right. Well, we, we as we are a lender ourselves. So our business model right now is is lending. So we, we make money uh, by being a lender or by buying loans. Um, we uh, uh, we've done over a hundred million worth of lending. Uh, you know, as a direct lender to borrowers. Uh, and um, yeah, essentially, it's it's uh, it's tr you know traditional uh, biz dev to direct to borrowers and, and to other uh, small loan originators. Thank so, you. so Kirill, the um, the benefit is obviously you you have a there's a liquid pool of capital out there that wants to deploy in real world assets within within DeFi. Um, but as you're the lender. How do you think about sort of the underwriting of those pools of capital, whether that's like AML, KY, like just underwriting the pools to make sure you don't have like bad funds flowing through. And then part two would be, what's your perspective on the way that DeFi yields are going to change over time and like the impacts it might have here? Because there is going to be some correlation. At some points, markets will become more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so just curious on those two things. Yeah, and on the second point, you know, we, we think that the rates obviously are not immune from changing in, in, in any market. And I think uh, we may see an increase um, as well, but we still feel that like we'll have a, a competitive advantage versus, um, you know, the, the inflationary period. But when we started this a year ago, we were not in an inflationary 
uh, time and, and rates were low um, in traditional markets. And we were still very, very competitive uh, because of the various efficiencies. And, and, and also, you know, uh, let's not forget the speed to execution um, is uh, extremely important both to the small loan originator that we're buying this loan from that yep. we can look, uh, you know, look again into the borrower. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, what was your first question? Just a little bit about the pools of uh, the actual credit provider the, the on the other side, like who they are, right. how you think about those maturing over time, any kind of AML sort of like compliance sides yeah. of that, that marketplace. Right, right. Well, right now we have uh, two protocols participating. Uh, one is MakerDAO and with MakerDAO, they mint their own tokens at the time that we add new collateral, right? So those tokens are essentially freshly minted um, and there's no, uh, no one's touched them before. And when we repay them, they're, they're destroyed essentially. Amazing. Um, and then um, the second protocol is Aave, and then Aave now has a permissioned, um, uh, you know, essentially permissioned uh, marketplace um, that uh, KYCs everybody that wants to lend in that marketplace. Gotcha. And then, sorry, a very last question, but as you think about the mature, maturing of your capital side, right, the DeFi side, do you expect to bring more traditional capital providers into this? through DeFi? Like, could you, is that part of your capital markets or whatever uh, function? Yeah, I mean, so, so the, you know, we have quite, quite a lot of interest from traditional uh, lenders as well. <clears throat> um, uh, they, they will certainly participate, we believe. I mean, they, they will, um, they, some are already participating in various, um, you know, uh, various uh, aspects. Um, and, and even in the, in the securitization pools that we have today, we have you know, traditional institutional investors, they're the minority, uh, but the, but the um, you know, we, we accept um, anyone that uh, fits the, you know, accreditation criteria. Okay. Thank you. Um, in, in the securitizations, are you retaining any of the risk on your balance sheet as part of the no. revenue model? Okay. Not at this time, no. So can you go a little deeper into the revenue model itself? Yep, it's uh, pretty straightforward. On the direct to borrower, uh, there's an origination fee uh, that the borrower pays at the time of closing, and then there's essentially uh, a yield spread uh, based on the rate that the DeFi protocols, um, you know, lend their capital to New Silver at versus what New Silver lends to the borrower. So there's a spread uh, there, um, and then if we are buying a loan from another lender. Uh, there's no origination fee. There's just that yield spread. And then on top of that, there is the protocols that we work with um, have reward tokens as well. So that is something I didn't even mention that, but that's another potential value. It's not something that we kind of build into the business model because uh, it's it's a lot less certain, but the uh, the reward tokens are liquid and they're, you know, they they add value as well. Okay, Kirill, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, judges, for your questions. Um, next up, we have Shamir Karkal of Silip. Shamir, if you want to share your screen and take it away from there. Okay, we can see your screen. Your time starts now, but you're still on mute. <laughs> Oh, glad that now I fixed famous, that. Famous words of the last two years. You're still uh, ex exactly. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I feel like I know a bunch of you on this call already, uh, but uh, I think maybe I should still just start off by giving you a quick intro on myself. Um, uh, obviously, probably guess from accent. Grew up in India. Came to the U.S. Um, was worked as a consultant for a while, but then my biggest claim to fame is probably that I co-founded a neo bank called Simple uh, about 30, uh, 13 years ago uh, now actually, and that was one of the first neo banks anywhere. And uh, what that meant is we ended up building a bunch of uh, uh, tech and uh, infrastructure, uh, and it actually took us three years to launch uh, Simple. Simple itself was acquired in 2014 by BBVA. I then got excited about building API platforms, did that for a couple of years at BBVA uh, before getting frustrated and leaving. And then in 2018, I co-founded Scylla. Um, and it feels like to me sometimes that across all of this, 
uh, I've spent like the last 13 years solving the same problem, right? Uh, programming on the internet is was fairly easy 13 years ago. It's gotten even easier now, uh, but it's still very hard when you try to do anything with, uh, with money. Um, if you're programming with email or HTML or voice over IP, quick, easy APIs, SDKs, money, you end up working with banks. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a few of them that will work with like innovators now, but uh, most of them just, they just suck. Um, and they suck in different ways. Uh, their technology is outdated. So you end up having to build a bunch of tech there. Um, uh, they're heavily regulated uh, organizations and they don't manage that as a service. So you end up having to become a compliance expert. And fundamentally, banks and traditional FI still struggle to understand innovators as, uh, you know, as, a, as a market, right? Uh, that's really where we come in as Scylla. We're pretty much the only crypto native API platform for programming with money in the US today. What that means is our core product is a restore HTTP API platform that does uh, onboarding of end users, whether they're individuals or businesses, identity verification. So, you know, KYC, KYB, OFAC, all of that, uh, digital wallets, virtual bank accounts, ACH payments, wire payments, basically onboard your customer, take their money, hold it, transfer it, and then pay it out to somebody else. And in between, you probably have some con you know, uh, complex funds flow that enables your business. We can pretty much support all of that. Um, and it, importantly, we do not just all the tech, but we do a good chunk of the compliance that's involved as well. We do partner uh, with banks. Uh, one is live right now, Evolve Bank and Trust, uh, whom we have went live with a couple of years ago, actually. Um, uh, and, you know, we do all the onboarding, due diligence, background checks, review of like uh, business uh, plan. But we do that uh, and, and then, you know, hand it off to Evolve on the back end. And really for our customers in production, they pretty much never talk to uh, our bank partners at all. Uh, we have, I think it's actually up to 56 production customers now, about 100 or so signed. Uh, and we are at about 3.1 in 3.1 million in platform ARR. I should uh, maybe just take a second to explain our business model here since I kept hearing that as a question. Uh, we charge our customers a fixed monthly platform access fee, 2K to 20K is the range in which that goes to uh, per month. Uh, and then there's also a transaction fee for KYC or a an ACH payment or whatever that goes in the other direction. So if you have a lower platform access fee, you'll be paying higher transaction fees. Um, and we pretty much the best in class ACH uh, processing solution in the in the US today. Expanding on that a little bit, we do same day and next day ACH. I think that's just stable stakes. Uh, we also have the ability to onboard an end user, link their bank account, verify their identity, and then pull money from that bank account and make it available in their wallet or account uh, instantaneously, right? Like five, 10 seconds. Uh, and the, the way, the, those of you who understand how ACH works know that nothing about ACH on the back end is, is real time. Uh, the way we do that is, is, is really by building a layer on top of ACH. And, and the real question is who ends up taking the risk? We can support it either way. Our customers can take the risk and we are just, you know, automatically making the, that money, uh, that the ACH settlement instant. And that is, a, a, you know, that's a different price or we can take the risk and guarantee funds availability. Uh, and in that, when we do that, we deploy a lot of uh, fraud checks, uh, you know, device ID with biometrics, uh, SMS confirmations, KYC, uh, account data from Plaid, combine that all into our own risk model, score the end user and the transaction. And if you approve them, then we'll guarantee the payment. If we don't, you can go ahead and process it and probably put a, you know, whatever, five, seven day hold on it because we think it's it's riskier. Um, we've been crypto native from the start. We have our own uh, infrastructure on Ethereum, uh, a smart contract, which some of our customers plug into directly. Uh, most, I'd say like, 98, 99% of our transactions are all on our private ledger. But for folks doing things like NFTs who want to be able to uh, transact on chain, we support that as well on Ethereum. Uh, who are our customers, you may be wondering. Uh, 
year, 18, 24 months ago, it was, I'd say, mostly pre-seed and seed uh, fintech and crypto startups. Uh, we've drifted sort of a little bit up market, and now we have more large later stage companies. Uh, but across all of them, the two personas we work with are the product manager and the, uh, and the engineering lead. Could be a CTO, CEO of a smaller company, could be somebody staffed on a team at a larger company. Uh, the core problem we solve is that they need to build a funds flow to power an app, it, and that's regulated, so it's not something that Stripe would typically, it's not e-commerce, um, and it's complex and it depends on ACH. Uh, and the more complex it is, <laughs> uh, the kind of the better we are at it, because that's where we that's where we win, is our ability to help customers build and ship that and scale them as they get bigger. The two biggest use cases that we see right now are crypto fiat on off ramps. Uh, so we uh, do ACH for uh, MoonPay uh, and, uh, and pretty much every one of MoonPay's competitors is either a customer or is, uh, or is in our pipeline right now. We also, the, the other probably the other biggest chunk of customers that we see are what I call PFM apps. That's a very broad term. Every things from like um, folks doing uh, you know uh, rent uh, deposit management to folks doing credit improvement for low to moderate income Americans, right? Uh, and and they have kind of the same problems as the the crypto fiat on off ramps. It's just that they you know uh, they're they're trying to solve different use cases really. Uh, we've been growing rapidly in the last uh, like uh, the last two years actually. I think last year we grew transactions about 15x and uh, and and we grew revenue about 3.5x last year. Uh, we were at 3.1 in ARR as of March of this year. Uh, that numbers I know it says 2.7 on the slide. It was actually 3.1 when we when we finished closing the books out. Um, and yeah, the and, and most of that is is being driven by the the scaling customers who are growing on the platform. Platform, right, uh, sales and marketing. We we really up until twelve, uh, like, like 15, eight uh, months ago. I think there was like one salesperson and me, but like the, <laughs> the like the entire sales team. We do have a kind of a we, we raised a Series A last year, brought on a CRO, built out our sales team, and and we have learned a lot about how to actually, you know, uh, not just like me doing all of the selling uh, but build out teams that uh, that do that uh, and that means that our you know our, we have drifted up market and our acvs have increased and we now have a real uh, enterprise pipeline uh, I could keep talking for a long time, uh, but I should just mention that, you know, it's not just me, uh, we're, we're up 60 people now, uh, but the, the core leadership team is, you know, me and my co-founders, uh, and then uh, we brought on Rick as the CRO recently, uh, Darren is our VP of finance, Isaac, our COO, and then probably I should just spend a second on Angela, uh, our chief legal officer, probably the single best uh, lawyer in the country for anything related to fintech and crypto. She's a large part of the reason why we're actually able to serve so many varied use cases and customers in the crypto space and, and do it legally. And, uh, and our bank partners still love us. I'm just going to pause right there. I think I blazed through that pretty fast. Uh, I might be the quickest presentation in here yet. All right. Well, judges. All right, I have a couple of questions. So uh, how does the Fatwire or like uh, RTP uh, affect your business or like, do you have any plan to support them? Uh, well, Fedwire is, is really just the wire payment system. I mean, there is also, of course, chips, but uh, we do all, obviously, we already support Fedwire in the sense we have APIs to do wire payments. Uh, Fedwire is a push only uh, system. So it doesn't uh, have any ability to like pull money from somebody's uh, bank account. Really, the only two ways to do that in the US are via ACH and via, uh, via debit card, really. Um, and ACH is vastly the cheaper option of the two, uh, but it does have a very unique sort of set of fraud use cases and, and, and timing and return patterns that you have to understand and, uh, and manage if you dive into the world of ACH. RTP is, you know, uh, there's RTP from the, uh, the clearinghouse, but there's also the new, uh, the Fed's new payment system, Fed now, which is supposed to launch uh, sort of late next year. Uh, super excited about those. They'll actually uh, bring the US up to kind of 
you know, state of the art across the world as of like 2008 or so. Uh, so we'll only be like 15 years behind the rest of the world. Uh, but the, neither of those, whether it's RTP or FedNow, have any real ability to do pull payments. They both have plans. They have what's called uh, request to pay functionality, which RTP is trialing right now. FedNow uh, is supposed to launch with it. Uh, but realistically, I mean, ACH is like 74 trillion of volume in the US. I expect it to be the primary mechanism for uh, for you know, debiting end users' bank accounts for probably the next decade. And hopefully RTP and FedNow will build out their request to pay functionality and we'll, we will be able to do much more of that. Yeah, I mean, whether push or pull, I think that depends on the use case. And I, I've seen like, you know, the needs for both. So yeah, I don't think totally. it should go away, but I've seen like, you know, a lot of startup uh, supporting RTP popping up here and there. So I was curious on that front. Oh, it's um, on our roadmap too, by the way. Yes, we, okay. we do plan to support RTP later this year. Sounds I totally see, agree with you. As a, as a payout mechanism, it's quite powerful. Um, it's still about like 60 to 70% account coverage, uh, but that's, that's still good enough and works for a lot of use cases. Gotcha. And I saw a pretty big uptick between uh, Q1 this year and then Q4 last year in terms of uh, transaction amount. Yeah. Could you add some more color on uh, what happened during that time frame? Nothing. Yeah, right really. there. Uh, just custom. You know, you sign a bunch of customers, and the, the thing about this is that, like, uh, there was like, if if like five customers get into their groove in the same month, suddenly you have a big month, right? We actually doubled transactions between uh, February and March, uh, and uh, and and we have been growing at about. 30 to 40% month on month uh, for the last like 12 plus months, I think since late 2020. Uh, so I think that's just going to, I mean, and I'm talking about transaction count, even dollars, all metrics are going up, but it's just slightly different, right? Uh, but, and it's, th th this is actually, I mean, I suspect if you went back and looked at like Stripe's numbers from like 2012 or whatever, uh, they probably look similar. Uh, we're, we're, just to put it into perspective, there's like, I don't know, like 200 billion ACH payments of like 74 trillion or something like that. So when you look at that and you look at where we are, I'm like, we could grow like this for at least a decade uh, before we even showed up on like <laughs> some of the charts, uh, right? This is just a massive, massive space, which is only beginning to change now. I have a question. Um, you earlier mentioned four kinds of products, the AC, the payments, uh, fraud, compliance and digital wallets. Can you give a sense of the breakdown of your revenue uh, and the interest in the marketplace amongst those four? Ooh, I mean, we, we, we bucket it that way on, on, on charts to, to explain it, but realistically, like, you know, it's, it's all intertwined in the APIs and most customers are using uh, most of that. Uh, that, that. That isn't really like a uh, sort of, I, I, I don't know of anybody, well, I'll say like the, the, the fraud capabilities we have, different customers use it in, in different ways. Uh, almost everybody uses the KYC and ACH and wallets. That's kind of the core of it. Some of them don't have fraud problems. If you're like doing B2B payments in a small-ish enclosed ecosystem, yes, fraud's not a concern for you. Don't pay for it and don't worry about it, right? Um, if you're doing... Uh, consumer crypto payments online, fraud's a huge problem. <laughs> you should be worried about it. Um, so it just depends by the by customer, really. And a lot of our fraud tools are, are super new. We just built them in the last six, eight months and we're continuously building and improving them because it's just a... Uh, it's just an arms race against the online fraudsters out there. It, it never goes away. Uh, and uh, it's, it's always like, I'm always talking to folks and being like, what are you seeing? What did you figure out? And, and there's like another 20 ideas for enhancements on all of this that we're working on. Well, thank you. Shamir, um, if you put the crypto play aside, why will customers choose um, Scylla over competitors like Rapid and others? So, right, I've literally never come across Rapid as a uh, as a competitor okay. before. Other, other the platforms. ones we the ones we the ones we have the we've seen from the start are probably Dwala and and to a lesser extent Synapse. Uh, now it's important to point out that 
uh, there's an exploding ecosystem of, I think, what's called BAS platforms, banking as a service players. Synapse was probably the first of those. Uh, we play in that ecosystem, but we tend to be a mile deep and two feet wide, right? So we don't do card issuing, as an example. Uh, Suresh's platform seems really interesting for that. But like, uh, we don't do card issuing, we don't do wealth management, we don't do um, bill payment, and we don't do like 15 other things. Uh, we partner with folks whom we think are best in breed in that. So companies like uh, Arcus or um, uh, Alpaca or Lithic, or, and then it's like we have 30 other partners uh, that we've built so that you can, we can be that hub where money comes in. Uh, the, a lot of the compliance comes, uh, gets done, and that's also typically where you'd see all the fraud problems. So you have to solve them there. And then it goes somewhere to pay off a card or pay off a, uh, a bill or invest it or convert it into crypto, whatever it is, right? Uh, why customers choose us over our, some of our competitors? I think we just have more flexibility and uh, on, on kind of the core APIs themselves, right? Like onboarding, KYC, KYB, digital wallets, virtual accounts, and ACH payments. Uh, if you want to do complex funds flows and you need to worry about fraud, pretty much the best in the space. So crypto is the new thing and all the rest, you think you just give a better, um, a better product. That's actually what you're saying. I think we do the we do the better we do a better product to everybody. Uh, crypto has just been a customer use case which has grown explosively in the last eighteen ish months. And you know when you when you look at the problem that we are solving, which is you need to scale ACH payments in a, in a regulated space, and you have to worry about fraud. You're like the ones who have that pain the worst are like the the, the crypto on off ramps, right? Folks doing crypto payments at scale, because guess what? All of these guys built their infrastructure on card payments, because that's the default online payments. And they probably have a wire desk to do like, uh, you know, OTC trades and B2B trades and all of that. But in transactions between a thousand and a hundred thousand, ACH is really the best option if you can make it work. Uh, and for them with the massive boom that crypto has had in the last year, they, they, are, they all have almost a desperate need uh, to, to solve this problem, right? And so that's why I think we've gotten a lot of crypto customers. Uh, I mean, the market's changing, right? Like there's a big crypto sell-off, a big like uh, stock, stock market mm -hmm. sell-off. Uh, so maybe that'll change. And in the next 18 months, we'll get a lot more uh, FinTech customers. Uh, we'll see, maybe we, we, we have one government agency on our, in our customer base, right? Um, and it's just, how did we end up signing them? I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> they came to us, signed up, got through uh, due diligence and, and signed up to process like student loan payments. And sure, it's legal, we'll take the business. What about uh -huh. cross-border payments? We don't do anything directly in cross-border just yet. My grand vision for like the Scylla of like 2030 or I should say maybe 2040 is to be that infrastructure layer that connects all the world's financial networks, right? Whether it's ACH in the US, uh, SEPA in Europe, uh, you know, UPI in India, and also the crypto networks, right? Like Ethereum, Bitcoin, and whatever is, wherever there is enough mass and enough demand, uh, we want to connect that and be able to take money from it, hold it, transfer it and, and pay it out into uh, whatever makes sense, right? So we do want to be cross-border someday. And right. we have a ton of like customers doing like international remittances mm -hmm. who use us as the US leg of their business. We don't directly operate outside the US yet. Just don't have enough time and, and people, and honestly, I'm not even sure I'm going to get to it in the next 12 months. Thank you. We're going to have to leave it there. Shamir, thank you. Thank you, judges. All right. So we have two more pitches left for today. Uh, next up, we have Kate Hiscox of SIVO. So Kate, I will turn it over to you if you want to share your screen and take it away. Perfect. All right. Share, share, share. Where is it? Here we go. Perfect. Hello, Landon. Thank you for having me. I'm Kate, co-founder and CEO at SIVO. SIVO is Debt as a Service, where our APIs enable companies to lend at scale. 
So SIFO is backed by Y Combinator, by the way. I also recognize some of the, the companies that are on this call and on tomorrow's call. Quite a few of you are pipeline customers of SIVO, so hello. Um, anyway, backed by Y Combinator. And since launching nine months ago, this is where we're at. We've had 6 billion in global demand for our debt as a service products. We've signed 2 billion in term sheets. We're generating 7.5 million in ARR, projecting that to grow to 22 million in ARR by December. And we are profitable. So let's talk about how we got to those numbers, obviously starting with the problem that we solve. You know, for fintechs and neobanks around the world, raising debt is complex, it's diluted, and it can take months and even years to complete. You know, for any company, speed to market is absolutely everything. And yet it can take up to a year just to build, test, and launch a new credit product. And then on top of that, you've got traditional sources of debt capital, such as funds and banks that don't provide programmatic fund disbursement reporting, and they often don't work with early stage lenders. So how do we solve these problems at SIVO? At SIVO, we provide debt lines that scale. Using our platform, originators can design a debt line to meet their business goals and be up and running in minutes versus months. Leverage increases by our originators providing live loan data, this is unique to SIVO by the way, via API to the SIVO risk engine with many companies, many of our originators achieving 10X leverage in as little as 12 months. So for well-backed, fast growing fintechs, SIVO is easy to understand, it's programmatic and it's quick to deploy, which our originators love. So let's take a look at a couple of those active use cases. Oh, let me just change. Yeah. Right, so let's take a look at those active use cases. Gas POS is the fastest growing point of sale system for gas stations and truck stops across the USA. Their SIVO deadline will scale to $500 million and our APIs mean that gas POS can dis programmatically draw down and disperse capital on demand, ensure an alignment with their growth trajectory. Let's take a look at another one, Plend. Plend is a licensed consumer lender in the UK that are building a better way to borrow using their unique Plend score. As an active lender in the UK, this grown really, really fast. Uh, their 20 million pound British pound SIBO debt line will enable them to scale that very rapidly grown loan portfolio. So now let's talk about um, just a quick recap on how SIBO works. So originators sign up, that's what we call our customers. They sign up and configure a deadline to fund their growth trajectory. Again, completely unique to SIVO. The SIVO risk engine provides time-based KPIs that that originator is gonna need to hit to increase leverage. The originator then sends live loan data to the SIVO risk engine through API, or they can actually do it through, through uh, Zapier. We support no code as well. And that data is measured against those KPIs. And leverage increases as those KPIs are hit Super easy, super programmatic. And SIVO deadlines, by the way, are a revolving product, which makes them ideal to fund car programs, buy now, pay later, invoice factoring, earned income access, or merchant cash advance, which are really the top five credit products that we fund. Now, originators pay a simple cost of capital. No additional fees, no warrants, we're very boring, <laughs> and we don't ask for ex exclusivity unlike other debt funds. We wanna earn our originators business. We don't try and force them to work with us. So what's next for SIVO? The, oh, got a little bit of a lag. There you go. We are focused, as you heard, on scaling our business to 22 million in ARR by the end of this year. This is year one for us, by the way, and shipping exactly what our customers are looking for. So what is that exactly? Oh, sorry. There we go, finally. We are shipping Debt as a Service version two, June 30. I am so super excited about this product. What we've noticed with originators in our pipeline that would show up looking for debt capsule, they had to lend for other, they had to uh, solve rather for other, other cha challenges in their lending stack, getting a lending license, a card issue we've talked about on this call, uh, underwriting, servicing, and so forth. So they would get held up. They'd be bottlenecked going live with us as they solve these other problems. 
So we're releasing on June 30 new APIs for real-time processing of credit, um, including payments, underwriting, servicing, card issuance, credit bureau furnishment, and of course, debt capital. This new release also provides access to a lending license for our banking partner and regulatory content. We have a pipeline of originators ready for this release, including both new and mature lenders and companies that are wanting to embed lending as a feature into their existing products. Now that's just on top of the upgrades that we released last month, including we released multi-currency debt capsule, Sivo now lends in six currencies, including US dollars, British pounds, euros, and Mexican pesos. We also launched Yield as a Service. This is for companies to put excess, excess cash to work to enrich their balance sheet or fund interest bearing savings accounts, for example, using SIBO if you're a neobank. I'm not actually sure when my team sleeps. Thank goodness they don't, but. So now let's talk about where SIBO sources its capital. Sorry, gotta jump again. Oop. All righty. Um, we were pleasantly surprised, quite honestly, and excited to be approached by funds and institutions that we thought SIBO would compete with. Uh, but in addition to them, in addition to institutions, we source capital from other channels, including the issuance of bonds, for example, that speaks to the, the experience of our team. But let's get back to why institutions would want to work with SIBO. You know, quite frankly, because we have the deal flow. As a YC company, SIBO has unfair distribution with access to 3,000 of some of the most innovative and well-funded companies on the planet, both from early stage fintechs right through to the Airbnbs of the world. For YC companies, SIBO is their first stop for debt capital and now yield for their excess cash. And every six months, we see hundreds more YC companies. On top of YC, VCs are referring to us from the Bay Area to London to Mumbai. And Mumbai. They're referring their portfolio companies to SIBO because VCs, they like the speed to deploy, the lack of dilution, and they like the transparency to leverage. So frankly, we couldn't do this without some incredibly talented folks that I'm lucky enough to call my team advisors and investors. About me, I've been building companies for more than 15 years. I've had exits, including an IPO, the rest of the SIBO team. DNA includes Capital One, MasterCard, Revolut, Lending Club, Northern Bank, Credit Karma, it goes on and on. Um, we've raised 15 million in seed funding from incredible funds, including Y Combinator, Maple, Dash, Tribe, and Northstar, who wrote checks alongside partners at some of the largest funds in the world. And of course, as I mentioned, we are, we are profitable. So uh, with that note, on that note, judges, I think I'm gonna claim the fastest presentation. I wanna give you back a few more minutes of your time and take any questions that you have. Thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you. Judges? Kate, do you have any added value to the banks and institutionals with your, um, uh, underwriting capabilities? Sure, so we, we underwrite based on live loan data. SIBO works in reverse, in fact. All of our originators start 100% secure. They deposit equity cash with us. They start off at 1X, and then we underwrite post fact. So they're able to go live very quickly, and then we're underwriting based on that live loan data. So we're not extending leverage until certain KPIs are, are hit. So versus the um, traditional practice of asking for reams of data up front, which is not necessarily ideal for a new FinTech either. Um, and the process takes months and months and months. We say, go live, you can go live today. You will need to deposit cash with us. That'll secure it. We give you a transparent roadmap as far as leverage. Originators love it. They go live, they send us the live data. We start extending leverage as they're hitting KPIs. Really impressive uh, pitch kit. We actually helped one of our portfolio companies do this maybe five, six years ago from scratch and it's hard. Um, I guess, the, I guess the, the question I'm thinking about is we well, kind of answered it in the, the, the buildup of leverage over time, but at the beginning, are you, are you using sort of third-party data as well? How much value do you find that you get from the platform partners um, in underwriting or, or is there a lot that you need to sort of fill in on the edges? No, absolutely. So we rely with the current products right now, we rely on our originators underwriting. They do the underwriting actually themselves. Some of them are, are using credit bureau. Some of them are using alternate data. Um, we know exactly 
how they've structured their underwriting, how it works. We know um, information about their target borrowers, min max, all kinds of different you know, data like that, that we measure against the live loan data coming in. Um, with the new release on June 30, we have a very good underwriting partner that has 10 plus years in consumer credit in the United States, very successful, that are plugged into our platform. And we think there's a real market for that there. In terms of the lending stack, there's so many great partners that are out there um, that can come in and plug into a, a stack into a network like SIBO and provide that underwriting capability. So we definitely see, especially more mature lenders, uh, they come into our pipeline that have been under, they've been lending, they've got an active loan book. Um, they've got, they've nailed their underwriting and they're good. We also see other FinTechs, earlier stage companies or very large companies that want to embed lending as a feature, don't want to deal with underwriting. We prefer to work with us and under the hood, we're working with the best underwriting companies in, in the world. Are you taking part of the risk, Kate? We, so in terms, so as far as our model is concerned, um, we book revenue based on spread, right? In terms of what we're sourcing capital out and what we're lending out. We have a lien against the loan book itself of the portfolio, the underlying assets of our originators. Um, absolutely, if our originator was to get into to trouble, for sure, we would be taking some of that, that risk. But when you look at our model versus traditional debt funds, again, because we start off at one X, and slowly grow based on live loan data. I mean, for example, you know, we're, we're uh, now entering a climate of rising rates and a recessionary environment, right? And so unique to SIBO, we see what goes wrong really fast, literally live versus traditional debt funds that are reliant upon spreadsheets that are filled in once a month, this type of thing. So when you look at the way that we structure leverage and the live insight that we have into the loan portfolios we've run, of course, it's not infallible, but it's it's pretty safe and tight, especially moving into an environment like this. So you're saying that the, the, the credit losses will be smaller, which I can appreciate. But still, what is the contract like? Are you taking contract? The, the contract says that you are taking part of the risk with the originator or only the spread? Uh, sorry, sorry. So the originator is taking the risk as far as the borrower not paying them. Obviously, we're not. We're taking risk if the originator wasn't able to to repay SIBO. So your the value that you bring to the market, um, how much of it is the the algorithms and your your risk profiling, etc., your risk decisioning versus the lending part? Sure. The um... You know, as far as the product is concerned today, the success we've had, which completely blows my mind, to be quite honest, just the process of, of raising debt capsule in the past, or at least with sources that are not SIBO, just takes a, a huge amount of time, right? This is just, you've got very fast grown fintechs, even when you've got a debt facility, when you go back a second time to get another one, or you want to launch a new credit product, it's weeks and months of meetings once again. And so we make that process extremely efficient. Um, as far as what we're deploying in June so that, you know, originators can come and solve for card issuance, underwriting, servicing, um, as well as debt capital, that just means they can get to market much more quickly in a way that's highly programmatic. So I think at that point, you've got rapid access to capital, rapid access to be able to deploy credit products and test them very quickly. So it becomes a combination of both capital and, and software at that point. So... The, the assumption in the business model is sort of, as, as I see it, in, is that you're lending to companies that typically, in most situations, it seems like would not have gotten capital from other larger financial institutions that would traditionally lend to these companies. So, but in order to scale that business, you have to also have capital coming in to support them. So how do you sort of see that capital continuing to come in while at the same time, same time you're lending to non-traditional institutions? Um, and I guess uh, secondarily, um, what do you do about companies that sort of graduate off your platform? Are you going to continue to upsize them or they do eventually go away and go to more um, lower cost of capital providers? Because in the end, you know, they'll probably be able to, they don't have to deal with your spread, right? In the end of the day, they will be a lower cost of capital provider. Sure, now those are two great questions. I would argue the first one, we don't fund companies that wouldn't typically get funding. We win deals from other debt funds all the time. I mean, these are best in class, very well funded companies of all different stages, right? So we have in terms of in our pipeline, 
we have the largest payroll platform in the world, right? Who certainly have just gone through a huge Series C and don't need, could work with anybody, right? We have, there's a very, very large old debt fund in the United States. We have a pipeline customer with them. This originator wants to move. They have a $500 million debt line, debt facility with that fund. Why do they want to move? Because every time they need to draw down, they have to send an email. They got to turn, they've got to produce a spreadsheet and attach it. SIBO is a few bits more expensive, but for the programmatic, the, the access, the speed and so forth that they're getting, they want to move. So we certainly don't fund non-funded, non-fundable companies, if you like. We fund our originators are backed by YC, by Sequoia, by A16Z, by a plethora of great, great VCs. With that said, um, to your next point, absolutely. You would think $500 million, why would they go work with SIBO? It's for the reasons that I've just explained. Um, as far as, you, you know, when you, it's, it's an interesting parallel, but when you look at Stripe, for example, Stripe are not the cheapest when it comes to payment process anymore. But if it works, it's fluid, it's programmatic, solid, why move unless you're gonna save considerable money? So I always joke about the only competitor I couldn't, I couldn't compete with is if JP Morgan showed up and said to one of my originators, I'll do your IPO, but I want your debt. If that, you know, we've seen, we're servicing, we've got originators right from, you know, just newly launched from, from, from a YC batch right through to very established companies with huge debt facilities already in place. What has been the default rate of the runs? The default rate. So we have um, right now, we're at, we're at zero, we're nine months in, obviously way at one and two. Uh, first cohorts, by the way, our leverage extends based on the cohort lengths of our originators. We also know part of one of the KPIs they have to hit and maintain is their own default rate with their borrowers. And that ranges. We have, um, you'll see programs that are more microfinance and so forth in Latin America, probably going to have a higher default rate versus um, merchant cash events where the originator has figured out how to put themselves inside the funds flow. Say, for example, actually another one, earned income access with a payroll platform where they're inside the funds flow, where default is literally zero, right, for them, because funds are flowing through them. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, judges. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have our final pitch for today. Army of Upspot. Army, if you want to share your screen and take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Let me know if you can see it. Yep. Okay. So hi, everyone. Again, I'm Armi, the Director of Financial Institution Success at Upswot. So we are a team of almost 100 professionals. We are a three years old company. And for this time, we have successfully established and managed cooperation with more than 50 financial institutions. We work with different banks. Uh, our main focus are community banks. But this slide is prepared for you to show that we work with any corporation. We work with MasterCard, we work with OnDeck, we work in wealth management space as well. So let me show you what we do for all of them. So we created the platform that aggregates 167 API-enabled apps. Our solution is a white label add-on to the online and mobile banking and doesn't need any deep integration with the financial institution. To launch our solution uh, usually takes a couple of weeks. Uh, the main idea and the main problem that we are solving is how to push uh, small and medium-sized businesses connect their QuickBooks data, Amazon data, Square data to their bank. How to make the outcome of the data connection so valuable that businesses of any size will connect the crucial data that they never disclose to anyone else. So let me show it how it works. Uh, let me know if you can see the screen right now. Yeah, okay, great. So uh, now you can see the online banking at First South National Bank. It's one of our clients. Uh, so where you can move your money, debit checks, manage cards, and to do everyday related banking activities. Uh, 
So this bank decided uh, that uh, our tech will look like this. It's fully customizable. Uh, so um, once the business owners start in the journey, they will be able to connect their business apps. So all the apps, as I have mentioned, are API enabled. It means that the credentials will be never stored. They are just talking running. So once connected the apps that they want, the next stage will be accepting the privacy policy in terms of use. Once accepted, uh, the data starts analyzing and giving back in shape of actionable insights. So the business owners will be notified about crucial events like that 23% of invoices are overdue based on QuickBooks data. They can dive deeper to see why did it happen, always with explanations and suggestions. So we have also added a new feature. We are testing it right now and we have patented this technology. So the businesses have an opportunity to boost their credit score by sharing the data with the largest credit bureaus. And there is no risk for them. The credit score will never drop. So once accepted, the online banking will be enhanced. So all the data connected will be transformed into accurate cash flow forecast, the so-called components. It's only one line of code for each of them. It's very easy to deploy, but the brilliant of the solution is that we normalize um, and know how to combine the QuickBooks data that was connected with the data from Square, uh, even with the uh, data from um, banks, other banks that were connected. On the top of this, we give an opportunity to see all the accounts that the businesses have in different banks. Uh, they can even initiate the payments. Okay, here's it. Yeah, and also drill down into the transactions. We have also one new uh, feature that they can view also their crypto, but they can't uh, initiate uh, payments. So it's embedded experience, which doesn't change anything. We also added so-called payment calendar, which combines invoices, bills, utility bills, subscriptions, everything in one place and notified uh, about like crucial events. You can see. So also we have here KPIs, credit score, and all these are so-called components. So uh, unfortunately, as we don't have so much time, I can show you the bank's view, which is very interesting as well. But for summarizing, um, we have already connected 167 API-enabled apps. We are not dependable on the anyone. We connected all the apps um, with our own hands. We clean and normalize the data. The most important that based on this data, we give an advanced analytics. Uh, so uh, to help uh, any employees of the FI uh, that doesn't just reflect the data, it gives suggestions to them. Any business owner to know what should be improved, what they should do next to perform better. And also the deployment cycle is really easy. So I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Judges? Well, that's great. Uh, I just want to understand it. So is this um, like a competitor to QuickBooks or um, is this a cash management system? It does a lot of great mm -hmm. stuff. I'm just wondering where, where it fits into what exists today. Mm -hmm. So no, uh, QuickBooks is not our competitor. Uh, actually, we don't have also direct competitors, but what we are offering, we are offering as we are white label, any financial institutions, for example, MasterCard can implement it and present it as its own product. Like uh, as you have seen on First South and National Bank, it presents as a new product to give their uh, small and medium sized business customers an opportunity to improve their a business by sharing the data and giving back the data in shape of different features. Thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for showing us the platform. So, could you just give us a sense of the distribution? Um, maybe the number of financial institutions, but more importantly, the number of businesses that actually connect. And then, mm -hmm. what percentage of those businesses that do connect are doing it because they want a loan, right? So, like, try to understand the intent of the connection. Um, cause obviously there's Kodad and other players that are in this space that are helping normalizing the data. So trying to get a feel for 
what the, the sort of business intent is. Mm -hmm. Sure. Regarding the statistics of business owners that are connecting their apps, it's 53% of business um, owners that connect at least two apps in the US, Canada, and in, in the Europe. Uh, so regarding uh, the normalizing data, uh, so they are connecting their data and giving back in sort of uh, the futures. Uh, the, um, the, the question was, uh, I can hear you once. Sorry, one. is that 53% is that, uh, of, so you go live with a bank and then uh -huh. Of all of the business customers, 50% are actually putting their, are connecting their apps. It's a uh, usual statistics that we have get from different financial institutions. Yeah, uh, we have That's already, good. yeah, integrated with uh, 52 financial institutions, uh, but not only banks. They are included MasterCards, OnDeck, for yep. example, Alkami, and et cetera, that I have shown you. So it's common statistics. And um, when we are running, we have uh, different ways of um, uh, launching. We have also dashboard. Uh, we are giving. Um, we can give uh, iframe, state and law solution, and etc. But the common uh, is that um, financial institution can choose to run with POC first. Their customers can play with dummy data without connecting their real data. Uh, pilots, when the financial institution can uh, launch with, for example, 20 of their customers to try to find out how it, it's helpful for them or not. They are running surveys with us. We are uh, helping them with marketing campaigns as well. And then they are going to production, launching with all of them. So it's up to financial institution. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Emmy, question, yeah. what is the business model? So it's B2B. Uh, we are uh, partnering with different financial institutions and they're with their business customers. So we don't connect with their uh, small, medium-sized business, small and medium-sized business customers. We are partnering only with financial institutions directly. But what kind of spread do you have there if you have to pay all the partners that you are actually using their data as well? Uh, uh, you are meaning we pay to the partners that we have connected. The apps. Yeah, what is the spread that is left? How do you yeah. make money? Uh, we are not paying to them for, uh, we have integrated all them. Yeah, maybe some ones are for commission, but uh, we are not uh, paying for them. And uh, the price, uh, the financial institutions are paying for each customer connected the data. So they pay as they go. Uh, the model is in that way. As you grow. Pay as uh, they go with their customers life, yeah. Are you like the like Israeli WIV, the one that was acquired by Brex? Is it this uh, kind of same company? But it can be, but not uh, as I mentioned, direct uh, competitor. You know, we are more similar to Mint, if you know, from Intuit for businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We are more, uh, yeah, it's, it's like similar, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, if there's no other questions, that will conclude our session um, for today. I want to thank all the um, you know, the companies for joining us. Uh, I want to thank uh, our judges in particular. Um, without their um, you know effort and support, uh, we can't do sessions like this. You can see uh, all of our judges uh, and companies that presented there on the screen today. So thank you very much. Uh, we will have results uh, sometime tomorrow um, after the judges score the pitches from today. But special thanks to the audience for coming uh, and watching today. Thanks again to our judges and our companies. And we'll see you again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for our semifinal round two. And as a reminder, coming up in two weeks, we have our in-person Lended Fintech USA event. Get your tickets. There's plenty of tickets still on sale. Lendit.com forward slash USA. And the finals will take place May 26th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern on our Expo Floor Theater. That concludes today's event. Thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you tomorrow for round two.